Hi, my name is James Coliander. I'm the director of the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences, and I'm really happy to be here with my colleague Ian Allison. Uh, as you may have heard earlier today in uh, Fernando Perez's talk and in the talk just prior to this, um, we've uh, worked together with some partners to make Jupiter Hub available at a rather large scale across Canada. And this talk is uh, meant to introduce some of what we've done and some of what we've learned from that process. Um, along the way, we'll also share the resources that uh, we used to build it. Um, so the Pacific Institute for the Mathematical Sciences is an institute headquartered at the University of British Columbia, but it serves a collection of universities in Western North America, including the University of Washington, uh, Simon Fraser University, UBC, Alberta, Calgary, Lethbridge, Saskatchewan, Regina, and the University of Manitoba, and our affiliate partner, Portland State University. So all these universities invest in being members of PIMS, and then together with our federal funding partner, the National Science and Engineering Research Council, and we're also an affiliate of the CNRS of France as a Unité Mixte Internationale, we run programs aimed at advancing um, discovery, understanding, and awareness of the mathematical sciences. And for us, the mathematical sciences is a very, very broad subject. It includes pure and applied mathematics, of course, but it also includes computer science and statistics. And we have programs that lead to the hiring of postdocs, and we run workshops and colloquia and seminars and summer schools and so forth. Um, and we're now moving into this realm of making some infrastructure available to support teaching, research, and collaboration by leveraging Jupiter Hub. So our, uh, we launched a service that we call Syzygy. Um, can you raise your hand if you know the word Syzygy? OK, so when the planets are aligned, they are in Syzygy. So when you have you know, a nice configuration of planets nicely tightly organized, so I like to think of Syzygy as somehow evoking an unexpected connection. And I like to think of this network as creating infrastructure so that a community of researchers and students and teachers can work together to find unexpected connections. Um, initially, I, I bought the domain name jupiter.ca, and I was quite excited to use that. But I was advised to not use that um, at top level domain. So we used Syzygy instead. Uh, we've launched this network of Jupiter Hubs in collaboration with some infrastructure partners who are actually providing a lot more expertise than just infrastructure. So one representative is Byron Chu here from Cybera, right in the back. So he's been one of our collaborators on this. And we've also worked with Compute Canada. So Compute Canada is the high performance computing platform federally funded that researchers across Canada can get access to. Um, to a certain extent, I think Compute Canada has served high-performance computing audiences extremely well, but it is not yet serving as well as it should um, other stakeholder groups that don't necessarily access traditional high-performance computing through an SSH tunnel. And so in some sense, the vision of the Syzygy network is to try to democratize access to all of this computing power so that people in digital humanities or people in other subjects that don't traditionally do high performance computing through an SSH pipe can access those resources. OK, so I'm, I'm just going to give a little bit of history. But before we leave the name Syzygy, if you get bored, have a look at the Wikipedia page for Syzygy because there's a lot of different definitions. It's also an episode of The X-Files. It's also a word game by Lewis Carroll. And there's like everybody seems to have cordoned on to it at one stage or another. So with those other partners, we the way that we approached the problem you were describing in the previous talk was we submitted a proposal to Compute Canada, basically. So we had to come up with a project. We had to design what we thought this project could be. So the first um, and probably the, the, the main designing factor was that we wanted access for everybody to be as simple as possible. So we wanted this, like it says on the previous slide, to be inst an institutional resource. So if I'm at UBC, I don't want to be giving out another set of UBC credentials for students to log in. They, they already have UBC credentials. They should just log in and start using it. And the whole design philosophy is gone from there. So we bring up these Jupyter Hub instances and just open up 
to everybody that can use it. And that's a recipe for overloading the machine. <laughs> but by and large, that hasn't happened. By and large, we have users growing sort of organically. So we have classes coming on one at a time. They're scheduled at different times. Students are, aren't always there. So we found that to be actually an effective way of exposing a relatively small amount of resource to a large number of people. The second sort of main design goal would be we don't have an admin team really to support this. It's mostly me for the Syzygy stuff. And I have a day job, like I'm a system and network person, so I only have a little bit of my time to dedicate to this and make sure that it's staying running and doing the right things. So whatever we were going to do, we had to make sure that it was automated, there was everything was checked into version control, and we could just hand it off as code to somebody else if I got hit by a bus or got sick. Um, we also really early on realized we were going to want to be hardware agnostic because there are all of these resources everywhere. There are like clusters that you might be able to get access on. You might be able to get access credits for one cloud provider or another. And you just want to be able to take what you've done and shove it there and let it eat up those <laughs> credits doing something useful. Um, so yeah, we decided we wanted to be hardware and cloud agnostic. And that's more of an aspiration than something we've actually implemented. Uh, as you'll see later on, we're mostly tied to OpenStack at the moment. But the ideas are there for how we would make it more generic. Um, Opening ourselves up to all of the students' accounts, something like 400,000 accounts potentially could decide to log in to one of these services and they would all crash at that stage. But we're talking about large numbers of resources, so we have to make sure that whatever we do, we're partitioning the amount of resources that any one student gets so that they can't take over a machine and ruin everything. Um, and at the bottom of this, there's a link to a GitHub repository where we've put the infrastructure code for everything we're doing. It isn't quite as polished as the infrastructure code you've been seeing from UV, but um, it's there. And this is how we're implementing the Syzygy hosts at the moment. I'm going to talk about a couple of the main tools next, I think. Uh, get this to go back out. There we go. OK, so tools and resources. Given those as our design goals, we were fairly we were shoved towards two tools that we've sort of settled on and built everything around. So Terraform and Ansible. Terraform, if you haven't used it, it builds itself as infrastructure for co infrastructure as code. And if you've ever defined a virtual machine with one of the cloud providers, you go through a form, you pick a flavor, you pick an amount of CPU and an amount of memory. The idea with Terraform is we want to do that in a text file. And we want to define all the dependent resources. So we want to define all the volumes you're going to need to support that, all the network interfaces you're going to need to support that. And we can capture that in Terraform, shove it into a repository. Um, and that's also where we're looking at doing any sort of provider agnostic stuff. So if we want to shift to Google, we just pull out the bits that say OpenStack, essentially, and put in the equivalent bits that say uh, Google. That gives us, once Terraform's run, that gives us um, a Linux virtual machine, like flat configuration, it's not doing anything particularly interesting. Um, so all of the heavy lifting then comes from a tool called Ansible, which you might have used. Um, Ansible, actually, I'm going to go back to the repository because it will make more sense there. A, has this concept of roles. So you might want to do some small task, like reconfigure part of the firewall, or uh, let's see, play around with the Docker storage actually install Jupyter Hub itself or a whole bunch of other stuff. You can write those as Ansible roles and then collect them together in what they call playbooks. That will just call all of these roles on the machine that you're interested in, configure everything. And the whole idea then with these two tools together is that we can go from a promise that will create a hub from, for you to something that the students can log into with their existing credentials in about an hour. So it just goes and most of that time is pulling down Docker images and things like that. So I want to brag about Ian. He's uh, really good at this. And let me just emphasize that. We can get a request. I'd like a hub for my class. And an hour later, Ian can have a provisioned hub for that class, because all of this stuff is orchestrated. Um, so I'm, I'm proud of you. But <laughs> the point. <laughs> But the, but the point of putting this stuff in the repository is that I don't need to be doing that. Somebody else can be doing that as well. <laughs> so. Um, OK, so we define these pretty vanilla Jupyter Hubs. You would recognize pretty much everything if you logged in to one of our systems. So with Jupyter Hub, you have two big decisions you want to make. You want to make uh, pick a, an authenticator. You want to pick a spawner. For the authenticator, we, we have a variety, but 
most of the universities we talk to have shibboleth systems up and running and that lets us integrate into existing credentials and stay compliant with the universities and that's a big deal. They usually don't want you creating extra accounts and then falling foul of some privacy protection law. So most of the time we're using shibboleth to do authentication um, and there's a role in the Ansible repository for that. So for the other part, for, Doc, for Spawner, the main thing is resource control. So we went with Docker Spawner because you have these nice controls where you can tell them how much memory each student should have, what share of the CPU they should have. And there's also lots of other little tricks. Um, you can muck around with the volume system in Docker. So actually, if I just give you that, I'll log into. So this is what one of our hubs looks like. Um, bounces me to UBC's education, or UBC's login. Yeah, so just seeing what he's doing there, he went to ubc.syzygy.ca, then clicked on that icon that launched the familiar campus-wide login infrastructure for UBC. He logs in like he would be to try to get to library resources, and then he lands inside of the hub right there. And then, yeah, so the, the only thing I wanted to show you here was we can muck around with the volume system, so if we want to put in a request for what's your experience with Syzygy, we can do that in the templates for the notebook, the way that the notebook application is written. We can write two-line modification to the template file, shove it into Docker, and this is suddenly appears for all of our students. And that we can give them feedback, we're going to have to turn this machine off tomorrow. <laughs> so I think what Ian's trying to highlight there Yeah, is the blue bar. The sorry. blue bar at the top is not vanilla Jupyter. So instead, it's a call to action. Maybe you can zoom that out. So it's just saying, we'd like your input. So inside of Jupyter, we can have some customization that informs the user base. Um, that we, you know, we're going to be down on Thursday for three hours or something like that. So there's a little bit of ability to intervene there. And then there's just a couple of other things that I find interesting in the Ansible repository. So for user file systems, we're using a system called ZFS that lets us do things like snapshotting um, and synchronizing file systems and sending them to other places. This came up yesterday in the discussion that's pasted on the walls for marking and things like that. You need to be able to take a point in time snapshot of a student's files that's immutable so that you can make sure that that's the thing you're marking and they didn't change it after the fact or you didn't mark it at the wrong time. So uh, just a, re a really nice file system tool and also Dehydrate is just another implementation of Let's Encrypt. Okay, so that's what one hub looks like. When we have a bunch of hubs, we want to make sure that they're staying up and this is an idea lifted almost verbatim from UV's work at the Data AX course. We've just uh, brought up Prometheus and Grafana to, to, to do our monitoring, actually. I'll jump out and see if I can go to Prometheus or Grafana. So there shouldn't be much going on just now. Yeah, so we, across the entire system, there's seven users logged in because it's summer and nobody's doing anything. Um, but this lets us keep an eye on things that are uh, problems that might be coming up, load, uh, keep load issues that we might be having. Um, and there's another graph that I was, uh, another dashboard that I was about to jump to that lets you drill down into the host and see, okay, why is this host falling over? Okay, yeah, and it's very bursty. So you'll see there's groups of students at UVic logging in. There's classes running already at University of Saskatchewan and things. So, so the colors there it. indicate different hubs at different universities or different hubs for specialized use at particular universities. Sorry, I'll go back. And you can see the bursting behavior. I can come back to this if it's interesting, but the, the roles for the way that we've decided to implement this are mostly already in the Ansible repository. They need a little bit of work, but they're there as well, and I thoroughly recommend them. <laughs> okay, so Syzygy today, that's like one an instance of a Syzygy host. I just want to give you an overview of what we've got running at the moment. We have 19 hubs at the moment serving 14 universities and then some others we're just calling them. So we're doing things like workshops. We'll bring up a hub for a workshop or there might be a group that want to use a weird language kernel. We can hide that inside Docker and so we'll bring up another hub to do that. Um, that's spread across three clouds. So it's spread across AWS, two OpenStack clouds, and then I've just called it some metal, but that's basically just virtual machines running on KVM. Like we have a couple of machines that we just have running almost on hardware. Across the lifetime of the system, we've seen about 8,000 users, and that's driven hugely by teaching. It, we envisioned this as a sort of a research project at the start, but it has been mostly students that are logging in. That, that's the big, big driver. Um, and as I said before, there are a lot of accounts that potentially have access, and we're finding more and more of them every year. Any, day, any particular day, we'll see 
in the summer from a handful to a few hundred across the system doing things. Um, the numbers at the bottom are just ripped from the cloud providers, just to give you an idea of the resources we're eating up. And what I want to get, the point I want to get across with these is they're very small numbers when you consider what we're doing. And they're actually much, much smaller again because most of these are shared resources. Most of these, it's like a fraction of a gigabyte because it's not dedicated to our VM, or it's a fraction of a CPU because it's not dedicated to our VM. Um, and what I want, the point I want to get across with these numbers is you can do something very nice with not too much resources, and then you can make the argument to whoever's providing it to give you more resources <laughs> and do something even nicer. Um, do you want me to do the testimony? I'll do the testimony. Sure. Sure. Um, so, I mean, we're in some sense speaking to the choir, but uh, our users are very, very happy. Uh, and you can read along on some of it. Uh, so um, one of the key benefits, the very first benefit, which we've already heard in many conversations previously, is you don't have to set up Anaconda on Windows for this person and on Linux for that person and on Mac OS for this person. It's just the browser becomes the OS. So as soon as you have a browser, you can access standardized computing environments for everybody in your class on day one. And instructors love that. Students love that right away. Uh, we, had, we ran a workshop that supported university industry collaboration on a big hub. Uh, and Aaron Burke was responsible for some of that. Um, and he really found the whole process to be painless. We took, meaning Ian took care of a lot of the moving parts. And they ran a really good workshop. Um, Patrick Walls uh, has been running a sequence of seminars that he calls S3, so the software seminar. Scientific software seminar. Scientific software seminar. He started about three years ago when our first hub came up at UBC. And he took, it's, in many ways, he's uh, doing things that are similar to what the Carpentries do. What he did was taught some people how to use Bash in his first class. And he's recently done things by bringing people who are biologists into using TensorFlow and uh, doing you know, principal component analysis and, and some deep learning. I just want to add, this is a true seminar. So they open it up to all students, all undergrad students, PhD students, postdocs. And they come and they actually do the pres presenting. So they'll come in with some idea. They've been through a tutorial on using TensorFlow. They'll come and they'll lead the session through. And then we ju we're just using Syzygy as a common tool for them to be able to do that. So. OK, so that's Syzygy as it stands, the plans for what we want to do next. Um, the main thing is we think the code base is relatively useful. There are lots of alternatives, but it, this can help us do things in other places as well. So what we want to do is take it, use it as a common foundation, and build other things on top of it. So yeah, so maybe just to, to amplify that, um, I think of Syzygy right now as delivering a Tesla Model 3 to everybody in Canada. <laughs> OK, but it's not a Ferrari, and it's not an aircraft carrier. But anybody who wants to do standard computing, you know, maybe a Honda Civic, OK? But, uh, can get access to vanilla computing. And it becomes a uniform base. And then how many can we actually deliver? I guess Elon Musk has that same struggle. Um, but there are also issues about what happens when somebody needs deeper computing, more memory. They need access to a GPU. And so we're exploring, and, and Ian can amplify that, some ways that we can embellish the initial offering so that people that need a Ferrari or that need an aircraft carrier may access those resources through their university credentials in a very streamlined way, and then may be presented with a menu to get a customized hub for that particular research or teaching or industry collaboration activity. Um, yeah, so I've sort of split our plans for that going forward into at least two sections. The first one is technical. So we're a victim of our own success in that some of our hubs are bursting at the seams. We typically top out about five, uh, three, somewhere between three and 500 users. Then we start running into problems. And mostly the problems that we've run into are these are all just one VM. And it's just hammering Docker in some cases. So the natural question is, how many, hub, how many users can a hub handle? And again, this is lifted from UV's work and everybody at the, the, the Berkeley Group's work on Data X. Um, we're planning on just doing this sharding procedure. So um, the only thing that's different from this is we're not doing it on top of Kubernetes. This is just on top of the, the, the virtual hardware. So the idea is when a student comes in or when somebody comes in, they land on this edge piece that looks for a cookie that's supposed to tell them which hub they're going to be going to 
they don't find it, they get sent to a sharding service. The sharding service looks at the resources that are available, makes a decision, sets the cookie, and sends them back to the beginning. So they'll then drill, do, uh, drill through to the hub that they're supposed to be using. Um, the idea then is that we can take what would be, if we kept scaling it up in terms of memory or whatever else, one massively expensive virtual machine and start paring it down to more practical 64 gig or 100 gig memory machines and just do a few of them, hide them behind the sharder and the students don't know the difference. This does have big limitations. It's sort of, the way that I view it, breaking what the hub should be doing because you're breaking the relationships between the users that are on a hub. So you, it, I think, has implications for things like NB Grader and other services that make assumptions about what who you can see on the same hub. But this should do a lot of the, the work of load balancing for some of our hubs, at least. Yeah, and beyond NB Grader, there may be ways in the future where the hub allows user one and user two to collaborate on the same notebook. But if those users are in entirely different hubs underneath the sharder, the collaborative potential within the hub may be limited because they're really in different different hubs, although they perceive themselves to be in the same hub because they approach the sharder with the same URL. So there may be some limitations in the collaborative potential for Jupyter in this scenario. Um, probably the more important thing is, as I said, we want to use this as a foundation for, or a common language for building other things. So for community plans, the first thing we have to do when I get back to Vancouver is add more Syzygy hubs. We have some requests coming in for Brock the Vancouver School of Economics and somebody else that I'll add when we get back. They're relatively straightforward. Um, we're doing some work with a really wonderful developer at UBC called Sam Hinshaw and Tiffany Timbers who want to, similar to, again, <laughs> similar to something that Berkeley are doing, integrate into Canvas this time. So instead of integrating into edX, integrating into Canvas so that they have a complete workflow for grading their students' workbooks and all of that thing. So they can distribute assignments have them auto-graded, brought back, and sent the results sent back to the students all through Canvas, which makes the university very happy because we're not exposing data anywhere. Um, we plan to keep plugging away at the social collaboration structures. So workshops was our first use case. Workshops was the first reason I was looking at Jupyter Hub because I, I used to literally have to go around, find a computer lab if we wanted to run a workshop, wipe the system images, reinstall a bunch of software, make accounts and all that, tear it down a week later. And I got sick of that, and Jupyter Hub was the perfect solution to that. So we're continuing to do that, but uh, advancing it and giving people way more options. We want to continue this uh, university industry partnership. It's a really great mechanism for having somewhere where students at university and industry professionals can come in and work on the, the same topics, because you can deal with proprietary data by hiding certain network connections and things like that. Um, and the same thing for the university. Yeah, government. just to kind of amplify, I mean, PIMS runs workshops and sets up activities to support research in mathematical sciences. So I view our investment in activity in Jupiter as analogous to our investment in blackboards. So we have blackboards so that people can give seminars and share their ideas. And this is another way in which ideas can be shared, collaboration can be facilitated. And it facilitates conversations between people that might work on climate data and people that might work on partial differential equations that model the climate. And so we're trying to create the ecosystem for effective collaboration across multiple disciplines where mathematical sciences play a fundamental role in the future. Um, and one thing that I want to do, <laughs> um, Felix Antoine Fortin is at the back of this room. So as I said, we initially approached Compute Canada, and Compute Canada is a research body. We can approach them saying we want to do something for research, and then we ended up doing something for teaching. <laughs> and to sort of smooth over that bait and switch, we have Felix's work. So Felix is doing all of the hard work of dealing with the research problems. So he's integrating his systems with Batch Spawner to all of these Compute Canada clusters as they come online. Um, and he has, he's built some wonderful tools to make that even better. So if you went to the SWAN talk earlier this week, they were talking about CVMFS, their, the CERN virtual machine file system. So uh, Felix has this fantastic piece of software called Jupyter LMOD that lets you integrate with that, and pick out the pieces of software you need to do some strange computation within Jupyter. So you're just picking some weird compiler version that you might need to perform some step in a calculation. He also has been doing related stuff with a lot of the workshops and things within Compute Canada. So 
bringing up Jupyter Hubs and things with uh, Cloud Init tools. So uh, basically, an alternative to what we're doing, uh, an alternative approach, and uh, bringing up these systems so that they can perform uh, one week, two week workshops and train users on how to get started with all of this hardware that Compute Canada says they make available to them, but then doesn't do the right bits of training for it. Yeah, and I just want to highlight that teaching versus research dichotomy. Um, so right now, Canada is in the context of a digital research infrastructure consultation. The federal budget 2018 allocated $572 million to enrich the Compute Canada Canary uh, uh, data storage ecosystem. And how those funds will actually get deployed um, is a bit of a work in progress, as I understand it. But I think when it comes to Jupiter, we're creating situations where the dichotomy between research and teaching is really artificial. So if you have a graduate student coming into your lab and you've engaged in a lot of best practices around reproducibility, your student might go through the process of learning what the lab did over the past two or three years as part of a training or a teaching exercise. But that process is equipping that student with the necessary skills and expertise to effectively engage in research. And so I think when it comes to the infrastructure that supports research, activities around training and teaching should not be considered separate from the research activity. And so the funding sources that are devoted to support research need to accommodate training and teaching investments as well. Um, the only other point I want to make is somebody in this room will probably be on the program committee for next year, and Felix should be submitting a talk on this stuff, and somebody should be accepting the talk. And I'll get one more suggestion after this. Um, yeah, so I think one of the main themes that comes out of this work is trying to do something with Jupiter is effective. So effort in this realm is more important than expertise. Now, to a certain extent, I'm picking on Ian when I say that because he has mad expertise. But uh, in some sense, one very talented developer launched Jupiter Hub on fantastic infrastructure provided by Canada and provided by uh, Cybera. But in some sense, Ian alone, with help from all of this infrastructure, launched Jupiter at national scale. And so I encourage everyone to be similarly ambitious because the cloud can achieve scale much faster than you might initially imagine. So somehow that's, I think, one of the key learnings that came from our, our work. The other thing that I can report is, you know, I thought I was helping out some mathematicians and computer scientists and statisticians. But once we set the thing up, we started having people from social sciences and digital humanities and people from government interested in what we were doing. And so I know that all of you know there is a huge appetite for this resource, but making it available um, really does create community. Um, one last thing I want to highlight, which may whet the appetite for 2019, and I also want to acknowledge our, our fundamental partner in another project that we didn't emphasize in this talk called Callisto. So in late 2017, in partnership with Byron and his colleagues at Cybera, um, PIMS received a grant for $1.5 million from the federal government of Canada to launch this pro program called Callisto. So Callisto, one of the Jovian moons, spelled with the iconic Y. Um, the challenge of Callisto is to build open education resources leveraging Jupiter targeted at K-12. And so we've used these funds to hire something about 50 undergraduate students at 10 or 12 universities over the summer, and they've been working with faculty and with K-12 teachers to build notebooks aligned with provincial curricula. Along the way, we've learned a few things. One of the key things we learned is undergraduate students writing in collaboration with a professor like to use their university level vocabulary, even if they're supposed to be writing a grade nine targeted education unit. And so there's a cultural difference between K-12 and K-12 expectations and post-secondary. The other thing we've learned is that many professors think that some notes are all you need to give a lesson. And teachers in K-12 want a lot more information than just some notes. They want to understand how to deploy, when to pause, what are the milestones in the lesson. And so we now have this dialogue between K-12 and post-secondary that's driven by the easy deployment capacity of Jupiter to try to figure out what computational thinking instruction looks like and how to build effective computational thinking. We've built some notebooks that are very interdisciplinary, like the Shakespeare corpus. And then we do natural language processing on the Shakespeare corpus. Is that a class in computer science, or is that a class in literature, or both? 
Um, and that's led to other problems because a literature instructor might not want to do that because it's got too much code. So somehow the incentives in K-12 are very discipline specific, but the opportunity with Jupyter is to present interdisciplinary notebooks that cut across the curriculum in new ways and we have to find ways to get people to, to um, take up that, that opportunity. And yeah, just as a, a last practical piece, if you're interested in the infrastructure, these two projects share almost all of their infrastructure. And because I get to work with more people at Cybera, almost any new development happens in the Callisto repository, which is linked from the SysG repository, but then gets backported to SysG. But the gen general idea with SysG is that it will be a bit more generic, the, re the repository. So. Yeah, and then I emphasized how much Ian has done. I think with Callisto, we now have a very powerfully capable DevOps team that's helping to um, convert the orchestration into something that's more production grade. And uh, I'm, I'm really grateful to Byron and his team. I think that says. So. Thank you. Sure, so uh, I think right now most of the shibboleth authentication systems that we are using to grant access are defined by the universities. So if you are a student at the university enrolled in good standing and your shibboleth metadata comes with the expectation that you should be accessing certain kinds of resources like the library, then that access path is shared with the student's login and so they maintain access. But then when a student graduates and becomes an alumni, the university likely, in many cases, will toggle that access pattern, and the student will likely lose access to the resource that they were accessing previously through the university. Now, we've separately launched hubs with GitHub authentication, with Google authentication, so we have some ability to be agnostic with respect to the access authentication, but we are a bit tied to the mission of our infrastructure provider, Compute Canada, so we can't just give it away to everyone, although in some sense we are with these Google accessible hubs that we don't broadcast on social media too much. Um, in the long term, I would love everyone to have access to appropriate tools to be an effective digital citizen, but how do we get there? How, you know, every government it has their open data transparency promise, and most people don't access that data. But if we could also offer the open tooling and the training to get access to the open data, we might have a more effective digital citizenry. But for the students in particular, it's really we, we concede that decision to the university and how they manage access to their resources. And in general, they do. We, we're not using all of the classes that we could. In general, they'll keep access at some level because they have to be able to extract some information for the government after the fact. So in most cases, the students could log in after they've graduated and we could figure out the right set of shibboleth attributes to check and let them use it after that, if that became important. After the class, the, like the, yes. yeah, as long as they're a student, they're in. Anybody at the university that has single sign-on credentials has access to these hubs. So you go to University of Toronto, utoronto.sysg.ca, everybody at the University of Toronto that has what's called a UTOR ID there can access SysG hosted, on, well, Jupiter hosted via SysG on Compute Canada. Same with Waterloo and McGill and so forth, many of these universities. So all students, all staff, all faculty. So, so you are uh, into Eastern Canada as well? Your map showed mostly Western. Yeah, so um, uh, there's a tweet that shows the map of SysG floating around. Okay. Um, so the universities that are members of our network are those Western universities that I highlighted. They are the visionary universities that invested in PIMS and this project. But Compute Canada is a national platform, okay. and so right now Syzygy can be turned on for any university in Canada, and we do have hubs outside of our, uh, our core network that are active and available. <coughs> York University, Queen's University, these are not PIMS member universities, but they're getting Jupyter Hub service from, from PIMS via Compute Canada. Okay. Any other questions? 
the persistent storage, I mean, is that, is that like per class or? It's tied to the student account. So that's probably the main failing in when we transition somebody from being on ubc.syzygy.ca to pims.syzygy or, or like another machine. That storage isn't going to come to along with them without some manual intervention, but it stays with them after classes and it's for the lifetime of their student account, basically. Like home directory. Yeah. That's right. They have a cloud hosted home directory. I think we offer a gigabyte of storage usually. Yeah, usually. Um, but if you had an account on the Toronto Hub and on the UBC Hub, your uh, underlying storage would be associated with the distinct hubs and would not be interconnected. They are, they are distinct hubs. Um, probably not right away. We'd st uh, spot it pretty quickly. And the, the other advantage of using the <laughs> university authentication systems is we can make their life very difficult from that point onwards, <laughs> um, because that's a like they're violating the university's uh, terms of service or whatever it is. But that's partly why we uh, followed UB's suggestion to set up these monitoring tools. Uh, but you know, I think many of us have considered the security risks associated with Jupyter, and they are considerable. Um, but at the same time, the opportunity to remove it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.